Oversea, under stone, day four. The dry grass was polished under Simon's <coughs> polished wood was like polished wood under Simon's feet, giving no grip as he slipped and slithered down the hillside, now on his feet, now flat on his back and elbows, holding one arm up always to keep the manuscript from damage. Behind him, he heard the noise of the boy from the village and slipping and village slipping and stumbling more heavily, his breathing, breath rasping in his throat, and an occasional gasp and curse as he lost his footing and fell. Facing outwards across the harbor as he ran down, Simon felt that he could almost jump straight out into the sea. The slope seemed much steeper than when he had climbed up by the path, dropping below him in an endless green curve. His heart was thumping wildly, and he was too intent on getting away to imagine what might happen if the boy caught up with him. But gradually, minute by minute, the panic at the pit of his stomach was disappearing. Everything depended on him now, to keep the manuscript safe and get away. He was almost enjoying himself. This was something that he could understand. It was like a race or a fight at school, himself against the boy Bill, and he wanted to win. Panting, he glanced over his shoulder. The boy seemed to be gaining on him a little. Simon flung himself down the rest of the slope, sliding and bumping on his back, alarmingly fast, now and again, coming to his feet for a couple of staggering steps. And then, suddenly, he was at the bottom of the slope, stumbling and gulping for breath. With a brief glance up at his pursuing Bill, who yelled and glared at him as he saw him looking around, Simon was off and away over the field, running like a hare, and feeling confidence surge stronger as he ran. But he could not lose the boy behind him. Stronger, bigger, and longer-legged, the village boy pounded after him with grim determination, striding more heavily, but never losing ground. Simon made for a stile in the hedge at the far side of the field, and left over, gripping the shaky wooden bar at its top with one hand. He came out at the other side to a quiet lane, pitted with deep, dry ruts, hard as rock, lined with trees, arcing overhead in a thick-leaved roof. With the sunlight quite gone now, it was half dark under the branches, and both ends of the lane vanished within a few yards to impenetrable shadow. Simon looked wildly up and down, clutching the manuscript and feeling the sweat damp in the palms of his hands. Which way would lead him to the great house? He could no longer hear the sea. Making a blind choice, he turned right and ran up the lane. Behind him, he heard the clatter of the boy's boots climbing over the, sty the stile. The lane seemed never-ending as he ran, dodging light-footed from side to side to avoid the ruts, rounding every bend there stretched another, curving on in a gloomy tunnel of branches and banks, with no break anywhere into a gateway or another field. He could hear the beat of the boy's feet behind him, on the hard, dry mud of the lane. The boy shouted nothing now, but pounded along in grim silence. Simon felt the thread of panic creep back into his mind, and he ran more wildly, longing to get out of the cavernous lane and into the open air. Then facing him round the next bend, he saw the sky, bright after the gloom, and within moments he was out again, running on a paved road, past quiet walls and trees. Again, he turned automatically without time to think where he was going, and the rubber soles of his sneakers pattered softly along the deserted road. The long, high gray wall along one side and the hedge of a field on the other gave no sign to tell him where he was running. More slowly now, he knew for try as he might, he was beginning to tire. He began to long for someone, anyone, to appear walking along the road. The boy's footsteps rang more loudly behind him now, over the quiet evening twitter of birds hidden in the trees. The sound of the feet, so much noisier than his own, gave Simon the beginnings of an idea. And when at last the road branched off, he put on a desperate burst of speed and ran down the side, turning. The wall ended at two battered gate posts, through which he glimpsed an overgrown drive. Further down the road, he caught sight of the rising tower of Truisic Church, and his heart sank as he realized how far he was from home. The boy Bill had not turned the corner yet. Simon could hear his steps gradually growing louder from the main road. Quickly, he slipped inside the deserted gateway of the long drive and wriggled into the bushes, which grew in an unruly tangle beside the gatepost. He jumped with pain as thorns, sharp twigs stuck him in, into him from all sides. But he crouched quiet, or quite still, behind the leaves, trying to quiet his gasping breath, certain that the pounding of his heart must be audible all up and down the road. The idea worked. He saw Bill, <coughs> disheveled, and scarlet pause at the end of the road, peering up and down. He looked puzzled and angry, listening with his head cocked for the sound of feet. Then he turned and walked slowly towards Simon's hiding place down the side road, glancing back uncertainly over his shoulder. Simon held his breath and crossed further back into the bushes. Unexpectedly, he heard a noise from behind him, turning his head sharply, wincing as a fat purple fuchsia blossom popped into his eye. He listened. In a, quiet, in a moment, he recognized the sound of feet crunching on gravel, coming towards the road down the drive. The gaps of light through the branches darkened for an instant as the figure of a man passed very close to him, walking down the drive and out through the gateway. 
Simon saw that he was very tall and had dark hair, but he could not see his face. The figure wandered idly out into the road. Simon now saw or saw now that he was dressed in all black, long, thin, black legs like a heron, and a black silk jacket with a light glinting silvery over the shoulders. The boy's the boy Bill's sullen face brightened as he caught sight of the man, and he ran forward to meet him in the middle of the road. They stood talking, but out of earshot, so that Simon could hear their voices only as an indistinct low blur. Bill was waving his hands and pointing back behind him to the road and then down the drive. Simon saw the tall, dark man shake his head, but still he could not see his face. Then they both turned back towards the drive and began to walk in his direction, Bill still talking eagerly. Simon shrank nervously back into his hiding place, feel, feeling suddenly more frightened than he had been since the chase began. This was no stranger to Bill. The boy was smiling. The, the man was someone he had recognized with relief, someone else on the enemy side. He could see nothing now but the leaves before his face and did not dare move forward to peer through a gap. But the footsteps ringing on the metal road outside did not change to the crunch of gravel. They went past, outside the wall, and on up the road. Simon heard the murmur of voices, but could distinguish nothing except one phrase when the village boy raised his voice. Got to get him, she said. Tis surely the right one, and now I've lost. Lost me, thought Simon with a grin. His terror faded as their footsteps died away, and he began to feel triumphant at having outwitted the bigger boy. He glanced down at the manuscript in his hand and gave it a conspir conspiratorial squeeze. There was silence again now, and he could hear nothing but the song of the birds and the approaching dusk. He wondered how late it was. The chase seemed to have lasted for a week. The muscles of his legs began to nag, protestingly at their long cramped stillness. But still he waited, straining his ears for any sound, showing that the man and the boy were still near. At last he decided that they must have gone out of sight down the road. Clutching the manuscript firmly, he parted the bushes before his face with one hand and stepped out into the drive. No one was there. Nothing moved. Simon tiptoed gingerly across the gravel and peered up and down the round, <coughs> up and down round the gatepost. He could see no one, and with growing cheerfulness, he crossed from the gateway to, his, to make his way back to the road from which he had come. It was not until he was several paces out in the open that he saw the boy Bill and the dark man standing together beside the wall, fifty yards away, in clear view. Simon gasped and felt his stomach twist with panic. For a moment, he stood there, uncertain whether to bolt back to the shelter of the drive before they could see him. But as he hesitated. Mesmerized, Bill turned his head, shouted, and began to run, and the man with him, realizing, turned to follow. Simon swung round and dashed from the main road. The silence all around seemed suddenly as menacing as the leaf-roofed lane had been. He ached for the safety of crowds, people, and cars, so that at least he would lose the awful sensation of being alone, with feet pounding after him in the implacable pursuit. Down the side road, round the corner, and along the wall of the churchyard, faster, faster. Simon's heart sank as he ran. His legs were stiff after the cramped paws in the bushes, and his whole body was very tired. He knew that he would not be able to last very much longer. A car passed him, traveling fast in the opposite direction. Wild thoughts flickered through Simon's mind as he felt the road beating hard through his thin rubber soles. He could shout and wave at the car, perhaps, or run for a refuge into one of the little houses that were fringing the road as he neared the village. But the boy, Bill, had a man with him now, and the man could tell some story to any stranger Simon approached and the stranger would probably believe that instead. Stop, the deep voice called behind, behind him. Desperately, Simon tried to fling himself forward faster. Everything would be over if they caught him. They would have the manuscript. They would have the whole secret. There would be nothing left to do. He would have broken the trust. He would have let Gamari down. His breath began to come in great, painful gasps, and he staggered as he ran. There was a crossroads ahead. The fast, decisive footsteps behind him sounded louder and louder. Almost he heard his pursuers breathing in his ears. He heard the boy call on a note of triumph. Quick, now! The voice was farther away than the footsteps. It must be the man who was behind him, almost at his heels, his feet thudding nearer and nearer. Simon's ears were singing with the fight for breath. The crossroads loomed ahead, but he could hardly see it. He heard half-consciously the noisy roar of a car's engine, very near, but it barely registered in his weary brain. There was a rattle and a squeal of brakes, and halfway across the crossroads, he almost collided with the rusting hood of a big car. Simon slithered to a halt and made to dodge round it, aware only of the danger at his heels. And then, as if the darkening twilt <coughs> twilight sky were once more suddenly flooded with sunlight, he realized Great Uncle Mary was leaning from the window of the car. The car's engine revved up again with a thunderous roar. The other side, get in, Great Uncle Mary yelled at Simon through the window. Sobbing with relief, Simon stumbled round the back of the big estate car and wrenched at the handle of the door on the other side. He collapsed into the creaking seats and pulled the door shut as Great Uncle Mary let in the clutch and slammed his foot on the accelerator. 
The car left forward, jerking around the corner, and then they were down the road and away. Chapter 8. But how did you know where to come? Simon said as Great Uncle Mary changed gear noisily at foot at the foot of the hill up to the great house. I didn't really. I was just driving around the village hoping I should find you. I left as soon as Jane and Barney came tumbling back into the house. Poor mites. They were in a dreadful state. They rushed into the drawing room and grabbed me bodily. Grabbed me bodily. Your parents were rather amused. They seemed to think we're playing some great private game. Great Uncle Mary smiled grimly. Gosh, it was lucky you chose that road to drive along, Simon said. I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life. Well, you must remember, I know Trewissick. When the children said they hadn't been able to find you on the path back to the house, I knew there was only one way you could have gone. You came out into Pentreath Lane, didn't you? There was a lane, Simon said, all shut in by trees. I didn't really have time to see what it was called. Great Uncle Mary chuckled. No, I dare say not. Anyway, I gambled on your turning out of that lane onto the main Trigony Road, which in fact you did. Good job you didn't go the other way. Why, Simon said, remembering the blind choice he had made in the lane with the boy scrambling over the stile behind him. In the other direction, that lane is a dead end. It leads up to Pentreath Farm, if you can call it a farm. It's been hopelessly neglected for years. Mrs. Pollock's no good brother lives there, young Bill Hoover's father. So does the boy himself when he bothers to go home, which I gather isn't very often. But on the whole, it wouldn't have been a very healthy place for you to run to. Golly, Simon felt cold at the thought. Well, never mind. You didn't get didn't anyway. Great Uncle Mary stopped the car with a final rattle and a roar and heaved at the handbrake. Here we are, safe home. Now you run along and, and clean yourself up before your mother sees you. There's some friend of hers come to supper. Luckily, so luckily, so she'll be shut up in the drawing room. Out you get. I'll put the car away. And Simon, Simon, halfway out the door with the manuscript clutched to his breast paused and looked back. He could only just see Great Uncle Mary's face, his ruffled white hair turned to a dark tangle by the shadow, and light from a street lamp up the hill, reflecting eerily back to make his eyes two glinting points in the dark. It was very well done, Great Uncle Mary said quietly. Simon said nothing, but slammed the door, feeling suddenly more grown up than he ever had before. And when the car had coughed up on the hill, he forgot all his weariness and crossed the road, holding his back very straight. Jane and Barney were at the door before he had one foot on the step. They hustled inside and towards the story upstairs. Did he catch you? You've still got it. Oh, well done. We thought you'd get all beaten up, Mrs. Barney, wide-eyed and solemn. You didn't get hurt, did you? What happened? Jane ran her eyes quickly over Simon like a doctor. I'm all right. There was a sudden bright streak of light in the hall as the drawing room door opened. Mother called over a murmur of voices from inside. Is that you, children? Yes, Jane called across the banisters. Supper's nearly ready. Don't be long. Come straight down when you've washed. All right, Mother. The door closed again. They're all talking like anything in there, Jane said to Simon. Mother and father met some long-lost friend in the harbor, and it turns out she lives in Penzance. I think she paints, too. She's staying to supper. She seems quite nice. Did he chase you for miles? Hundreds of miles, Simon said. He yawned. Hundreds and hundreds. And then Great Uncle Mary turned up just when I was going to get caught. We sent him out for you, Barney said eagerly. They went on up the stairs. We didn't send him, Jane said reprovingly. He went like a rocket as soon as he heard what had happened. Well, he wouldn't have gone if he, we hadn't told him, and then Simon wouldn't have gotten got rescued. Barney was glowing with excitement. He would have given his ears to have been the hero of the chase. We didn't know which way you'd gone. We tailed Miss Withers for a bit, but she just went down the headland and sat down on the grass at the bottom looking out at the sea. His voice rose through the incredible squeak. So we rushed home, and Great Uncle Mary was just back from fishing. We were jolly glad to see you getting out of the car, he added, added unexpectedly. Not half so glad as me, Simon yawned again and rubbed his forehead. I do feel mucky. It must have been when I hid in those bushes. Come on, I can tell you while I washed. First they were too busy eating to talk, and then towards the end of supper too busy trying not to fall asleep. So all three children were grateful that Miss Hatherton was there. She was a small, bright, bouncy person, quite old, with craft gray hair and twinkling eyes. She was a sculptress, a famous one, Great Uncle Mary told them afterwards, and had taught Mother when she was a student at art school. She also seemed to have a passion for catching sharks. And at the supper table, she alternated between enthusiastic, dis enthusiastic discussions of art with mother and fishing with father. The children listened with interest, but were relieved when Mrs. Pock brought the coffee in and mother, who had not missed their yawns, sent them to bed. Nothing like Cornish air to send you to sleep, Miss Hatherton said cheerfully as they pushed back their chairs and said goodnight. If any of these fellows in your footsteps, she added to mother, it'll be that one. She pointed, follows in your footsteps. She pointed disconcertingly at Barney. Barney blinked at her. What do you want to do when you grow up, young man? She asked him. 
I'm going to be a fisherman, Barney said promptly, with a big boat like the white heather. Miss Hatherton roared with laughter. You tell me that in ten years' time, she said, and I shall be very surprised. Good night. I'll buy your first picture. She's dotty, Barney said as they went upstairs. I don't want to be a painter. Never mind, Simon said. She's nice. Don't go, Jane. Come in our room for a minute. I think the mayor's coming up. He made sort of a face at me as I closed the door. They waited, and in a few moments, great Uncle Mary appeared in the doorway. I can't stay more than a minute, he said. I am engaged in the beginnings of what promises to be a long and heated discussion with Miss Hatherton and your mother over the relative merits of Carviaggio and Salvatore Rosa. Coo, said Barney. As you say, Barnabas, coo. I rather think I'm out of my class with those two, however. You marry, we found it, Jane said eagerly. We found the second step, and we've started properly now. It's one of the standing stones on Kamar Head. The, <coughs> the boys did it between them, really, she added, honestly. Come on, Simon, get the manuscript out. Simon got up and retrieved the telescope case, telescope case, grubbier and more battered now than it had been, from the top of the wardrobe. They laid the scroll out on the bed and showed her great uncle Mary the rock where it had begun. In the small rough sketch of the sun and how they had worked their way into the standing stone. But we can't tell which standing stone it is on the map, Simon said, because they don't look the same here as they actually do on the headland. They all bent over the drawing that they still could not help calling a map. Great Uncle Mary looked at it in silence. You're Mary, Jane said tentatively, an idea that she could not quite grasp beginning to chase about her brain. Would we have done the whole thing on the same system, do you think? Whatever do you mean, Simon said, bouncing flat on his back. Well, you remember when we were trying to work out the first bit, and I said that it ought to be the way all treasure maps start, six paces to the east or something. And you said, no, it might be done by getting one thing in line with another as sort of a pointer. Well, well, does that mean that you should have should have to get you have to get everything in line with something else at every step? All the clues going to be the same kind of clue? You mean next we shall have to get something in line with the standing stone? Great Uncle Mary was still gazing down at the map. It's possible. What makes you think so? That, Jane said. She pointed at the map. Everyone feared. I can't see anything, Barney said curiously. Look there, over the end of Kamar Head. But that's just another one of those blodges, Simon said in disgust. How can that mean anything? Doesn't it remind you of anything else? No, Simon said. He lay back again and yawned. Great Uncle Mary looked from one to the other and smiled to himself. Oh, really, Jane said, exasperated. I know you've done jolly well today. I know you're tired, but honestly, I'm listening, Barney said at her elbow. What about the blodge? It's not a blodge at all, Jane said. At least I don't think so. It's a bit smudged, but it's a circle, a properly drawn one, and I think it means something. It looks just like the other one, the one over the standing stones that turned out to be the setting sun. Simon propped himself up on his elbows and began to take an interest again. Jane went on, thinking aloud. The way the first clue worked, we had to find the stone that was in line with the sun and the rock we started from. And then we had to go to the stone and check that it was the right one by the shadow. Well, perhaps now we have to do the same thing. Find something that's in line with the stone and then go to it and see if its shadow points back to the stone. Great Uncle Mary said softly, the signs that wax and wane but do not die. Jane turned to him eagerly. That's it. That's what he said, isn't it? In the manuscript. There must be all sorts of clues in the writing as well as in the drawing. Only they're even more buried and we don't know how to get at, get at them. This shadow bit, that's shadow business, Simon said doubtfully. Couldn't it be simpler than the way you just said? Perhaps we all, all we have to do is find out what the shadow of our standing point, standing stone points at. But it points back at the place we started, Barney said, because he didn't use it as his first clue. His first clue was, look and see what's between you and the setting sun. The shadow was just our way of proving it. Well, it doesn't have to be a shadow made by the setting sun this time. That's where my blodge comes in, Jane said. Barney said sleepily. Perhaps at the ri it's the rising sun. Oh, it can't be. It isn't in the right place. No, Simon said. Of course it isn't. It's just a blodge. Jane sputtered with impatience and glanced at him. Oh, why does it have to be the sun at all? Great Uncle Mary was still sitting silent and statuesque on the edge of the bed. He said again lovingly to himself, the signs that wax and wane but do not die. Simon gazed at him blankly. Don't you see? Jane almost howled at him. It isn't the sun. It's the moon. Simon's face began to change like the sky on a windy day, different expressions chasing one another across it. He looked from Jane to the map, to Great Uncle Mary. Great Mary, he said accusingly, I believe you knew all the time. Is she right? Great Uncle Mary stood up. The bed creaked as he rose, and he, 
his height seemed to fill the room. The light swinging from the ceiling behind his head cast his face into shadow and brought back once more to all three of them the old sense of mystery. His great dark figure, with a mist of light faintly silvery silver round his head, left them silent and awed. This is your quest, he said. You must find the way every time yourselves. I am the guardian, no more. I can take no part and give no, you no help beyond guarding you all the way. He turned slightly so that the light shone on his face, and then his voice was ordinary again. I imagine you'll need some guarding on this next stage, too. You know what it is now, don't you? Simon said slowly. We have to find which way the shadow of the standing po stone points at night, under the moon. Barney said, matter of fact, the full moon. The full moon? Jane's blodge, he drew it round, not crescent shape, so it must mean the full moon. What is it like now? You're not going up on the headland to look at the moon tonight, Great Uncle Mary said firmly. No, I didn't really mean that. I don't think I could manage it anyway, Simon stifled another yawn. I wondered whether the moon was full or not now. We should have to wait for ages, if it were all thin and new. It's full tonight, Jane said. I can see it shining in through my bedroom window, so that means it will be almost as bright tomorrow. Would that do, Mary? I mean, could we go and look tomorrow night? Before the great uncle could answer, Simon was sitting up again looking thoughtful. There's one thing wrong with all this. If we've got a moon that's only just past full, then we've got all the light we have to have. But the moon changes, doesn't it? I mean, it rises and sets at different times and in different places according to the time of year. Well, we're in August now, but how do we know that the Cornishman wasn't looking out his clues, working out his clues in the middle of January or April or something, when the moon wouldn't look the same as it does to us. You're just being awkward, Barney said. No, said Great Uncle Mary, he's right. But I will say just one thing. I think you will find that this is the right time of the year. Call it luck, call it anything you like, but since you were able to follow the first clue, I think you'll find you're able to follow the rest as well. And yes, Jane, tomorrow night would do very well for looking at the moon and the standing stones. Especially well for a reason you don't know yet. Just after you came up, Miss Hatherton was asking your parents to go and see her studio in Penance tomorrow and to stay the night. Oh, will they go? Wait and see. Go to bed and try not to put all your faith in the moon. There may be greater problems still waiting for you than you than you think. Mother stood with her hand on the door of Miss Hatherton's small beetle-like car. Now you're sure you'll be all right, she said doubtfully. Oh, Mother, of course we shall, Jane said. What could possibly happen to us? Well, I don't know. I'm not altogether happy about leaving you What with that burglary. That was ages ago now. So, so long as you don't get the place on fire, Father said cheerfully. Miss Hatherton had promised to take him shark fishing the next day, and he was excited as a schoolboy. Don't let them go to bed too late, Uncle Mary, Mary Mother said, getting into the car. Now don't worry, Ellen. Great Uncle Mary said pater <coughs> paternally from the doorstep, looking like an Old Testament patriarch with the children clustering round him. I shan't have a chance to lead them astray with Mrs. Pock living in. We shall all probably die of overeating instead. Are you sure you won't come, all, come up, all come to Miss Atherton and lean, lean across the steering wheel, blinking in the morning sun? The car lurched slightly as Father squeezed himself into the back. Simon landed in his fishing rods after him, handed in his fishing rods after him. No, honestly, thank you, he said. It's no good. You can't tear these three away from Tewissick, Father said. I've never seen anything like it. Even trying to get them as far as the next village is like prizing a limpet off a rock. I daren't think what's going to happen when the time comes to go home. Well, well, they know their own minds, and I can't tempt you away, Professor Lyon. Oh, dear, Mother said. I'm sorry you're stuck, struck with them, Mary. She made a face at the children. Nonsense, Great Uncle Mary said. This is my element. Disgusting place. Finance, anyway. He scowled horribly at Miss Hatherton, who grinned amiably back. Trippers, ice cream, and a little brass piskies. Commercialized. You can keep it. Well, Miss Hatherton said with a grin starting the engine, off to the piskies. We'll send you a stick of rock, Professor. Goodbye, goodbye, children. The car moved off, a ragged course of farewell following it. Goodbye, Mrs. Paul trilled, appearing suddenly behind them on the doorstep and waving a tea cloth. The little car chugged up the hill and out of sight. Well, now. Isn't that nice, the two of them going off together, Miss Bach said sentimentally. Quite like old times, I'll be bound, before the troubles began, she wagged her tea cloth at the children. You mean us, demanded Barney indignantly. That I do, proper headache you be. Still, you know, you'll do, I dare say. She vanished, beaming back to the kitchen. Jolly use 
Please will that Miss Hatherton, Simon said with satisfaction. Of course, I hope they have a lovely time and all that, but it does leave the coast clear, doesn't it? That moonlight shadow, Jane said thoughtfully. You know, I've been thinking. No thinking today, Great Uncle Mary said firmly. We can't do anything until tonight. I haven't been in the sea since I came down here this year. I think you should all take me down for a bath. A bath? For a bath? Barney's voice rose in amazement. That's right, Great Uncle Mary glared down at him through bristle white, bristling white eyebrows. You think I'm too old to swim? Is that it? Er, no, 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 not at all, Uncle Mary, Barney said, confused. I just never thought of you in the water, that's all. But what about the map? Jane wailed. We've just got going, Simon said reproachfully. Well, and we shan't stop. We'll spend a nice quiet day on the beach in the sunshine. Grand Uncle Mary grinned at them. And who knows, perhaps there'll be a moon tonight. And there through the windows of the gray house the moon hung. In the late August evening, when they were back from their day and washing before Mrs. Paul called them down to supper. The sun had flamed down on the beach all day and they were all tanned. Barney's fair skin was burning an angry red. But now the moon dominated the sky, a sky deepening after the sunset to a strange gray black with all but the brightest stars dimmed by the milky, luminous sheen that flowed over sky and sea without seeming to come from the moon at all. Simon said, low and excited, it's a perfect night. Hmm, Jane said. She had been outside to look at the sky and to study nervously the black outline of Kamar Head, rising dark and impenetrable behind the house. Like Simon, she was excited, but the old uneasiness was back as well. It would be better, she told herself severely, not to think about the dark, or at least to think of it as the same dark in which the long-ago Cornishmen worked out the clues that they were following now. For, but perhaps in this darkness, too, there still lurked the evil, which had been creeping up on them, then, from the unfriendly east, threatening the grail as he sought un urgently for a hiding place. Perhaps it was waiting for them out there. Why was there no light burning on the Withers', Withers yacht? Oh, stop it, Jane said aloud. What? said Simon in surprise. Nothing. I was talking to myself. Oh, good. There's the bell. Come on. Mrs. Polk, in the intervals of carrying heaped plates from the kitchen and empty ones back out again, was in a very firm, motherly mood. Great Uncle Mary told her that they were going night fishing off the outer harbor, and at once she began laying great plans for filling thermos flasks with hot coffee and leaving plates of sandwiches ready in the kitchen for their return. But she would not hear of Barney going, too. You're, you am not going anywhere with your sunburn like that, my dear. It wouldn't be sensible now. You stay here with me and have a nice early night. That'd be the best thing for, by far. If you go out, you'll be rubbing and blistering quick as anything, and then you'd find yourself in bed tomorrow when you could be out in the sunshine, and you wouldn't want like that, would you? I should be perfectly all right, Barney said half-heartedly. Mrs. Polk had painted calamine on his sunburned legs, but they were very sore and tender. Although he tried to hide the pain, he winced every time he took a step, and he was very sleepy after the day spent running and swimming in the open air. Great Uncle Mary said, I think it would be best, Barney. If you're awake, we'll come and report to you when we get in. That you won't, Mrs. Polk said. She treated Great Uncle Mary for all her respect for, all her respect for the professor with exactly the same indulgent strictness that she did with Simon and Barney and Jane. I'll have a good long sleep on the stern till morning. And then he'll wake up fresh as a daisy with all that soreness gone, and he can hear all about everything then. 